they ask themselves what can be done to um, alleviate it. You know, they see images of children on Greek islands, on of refugees in Bosnia, of people drowning in the Mediterranean. But this empathy can drive policy or it can lead to resignation. And it leads to resignation when publics have the sense after a public debate that really this suffering uh, can't be changed, that somehow it's inevitable. And that then leads to empathy and pictures of suffering, images of people in pain, no longer leading to change. This is the moment we're at in, Mo in Europe at the moment, and perhaps globally. So what I would like to do is ask the very direct question, how to save the refugee convention today in Europe when our practices at our borders violate it every single day, not as an accident, but as a matter of policy. Now, the idea of factfulness is from this book. Uh, many of you will know it. If you haven't, I really recommend it. Because what Hans Rosling, uh, uh, the late Swedish um, doctor and development expert, described as mega misconceptions is one of the central problems in the debate on refugees and borders. Rosling calls uh, our tendency to have an overdramatic worldview based on an instinctual approach to images as something that we need to cure by facts if we want to have action that is not only driven by data, but that is also effective. If we want to create a consensus in society to act in a way that changes things, we need to do so based on facts. When he says that, and he says we should think behind, beyond the obvious, and then he starts his book with his story of uh, well, uh, swallowing a sword. Because he says that it's all very well to talk about facts, but what people remember are stories, images, people. So even this doctor realizes that while facts are the basis of good policy, it's the communication of stories and people, including of himself, that creates public attention. And so let me start with a story and then go to the facts. Let me start with a film, which uh, is a big hit in Spain at the moment. Uh, it's decorated and discussed, Adu. It's on Netflix if you haven't seen it. And it is a film about a child. This is the director, Salvador Calvo. And it is a, a, a story about an irregular migrant. Adu is this child, Cameroon, that's the story, wants to join his father in uh, France. His father is in France, we don't know why. We don't know why, um, well, we do know why Adu has to flee, but in the end, his hope is to cross West Africa and reach Europe. And Europe in this case means uh, the city on the other side of that fence, which is the city of Melilla, Spanish enclave in Morocco. And the, it's a very inspiring message. Unfortunately, it is also very inaccurate. In the story, the message, it's a familiar one, is that fences don't stop people. They never stop anyone, the director said in an interview. And this, of course, is the fence around the Spanish enclaves in Morocco. Fences can hurt people. Many people who try to cross across these fences into Ceuta and Melilla uh, are injured. Some die, like in 2014, when uh, more than a dozen people were shot by rubber bullets trying to swim around the fence to get into Spain and into the European Union. Those who made it were then pushed out immediately. A reminder that pushbacks are not a new phenomenon in uh, the European Union. But some always make it. In 2018, this is just a picture of a group of African migrants who crossed the fence, who climbed across in a big group who overwhelmed the police and the Guardia Civil and arrived in the European Union. And the story and the message of Salvador Calvo about his film Adu is that this was inspired by millions of true stories. His boy, in the end, also makes it to the European Union. The last image of the film is that, and here is the message, in 2018, more than 20, 70 million people abandoned their homes in search of a better world. Uh, that was in 2018. Well, you know, of course, this is taken from the UNHCR numbers of people displaced worldwide. That was the report every year, UNHCR, 70.8 million people forcibly displaced. Uh, in uh, 2019, it was 10 million more, 79.5 million forcibly displaced. 
and that is what the director wants to do. Remind, shake people up, say, listen, here is a story, feel empathy. Here is a little boy, but he stands for 80 million people. And these graphs, of course, which we see everywhere in the debate on migration, on refugees, on displacement of a rapidly rising number of people displaced. Now, I uh, had an interview last week on this book um, written by an American Singaporean um, management consultant, Farah Khanna, where he makes the claim that because of environmental uh, devastation, 4 billion people will move to the global north in the next few decades. And I was asked by the Tagesanzeiger in Switzerland what I thought about it. If you're interested in read German, I'll send you the interview. But the point is that all of this creates a situation where politicians like Viktor Orban get up and say, wait, this is an invasion. What uh, the film describes, what these books describe, is the worst nightmare for European publics. As Orban puts it, in 2018 and during an election campaign, 30 million people will come from Africa to Europe till 2020. It was a claim he repeated and he kept saying that it's based on science. He referred to NATO reports and uh, other studies. Actually, I describe it in my book, uh, how he managed to get, get this figure. But the real question for his audience, will not check his sources, is, is this believable? That 30 million people might come from Africa in two years to Europe. Uh, others, of course, have exploited this in a politics of fear. We all remember Nigel Farage in Britain in the Brexit campaign using images of out of control irregular migration to call for taking back control. And the stories behind these fears are really linked to images, images of tsunamis, of waves. It is as if uh, there is nothing that can be done except, and this is of course Orban's and Farage's claim, drastic measures. Now, is this image believable? It's very important for organizations like CARE, for, for experts like my, my colleagues and myself. How are we communicating about what is really the bigger picture of migration and displacement? We all know what the causes are supposed to be. It's this concept of migration pressure. And I, as you will see, I am very strongly urging not to use this concept for the following reason. Well, what is migration pressure supposed to be? It's that people, because of conflicts, like in Syria, are forced to leave. It's that people, because of repression in countries like Russia, Azerbaijan, Yemen, uh, Turkey, are forced to flee. It's that massive global poverty, one billion people in extreme poverty, create migration pressure. It is the sense that desertification, climate change, eco ecological catastrophes, as Farah Khanna puts it, will mean that billions will have to move. Migration pressure is a result of demographic pressure, of population growth, but it's also linked to communication, that people in poor countries, less developed countries, understand what is possible in rich countries and then pack up, sit on their suitcase, pack up and leave. And they leave across the land borders and they leave across the sea borders. It's a language of migration physics, of flows, of streams, of communicating vessels. We all know this language. We, I, I have to catch myself because I often use it myself and then I say, no, this is dangerous. Let's not talk about refugee flows, refugee streams. Communicating vessels is the idea that if you sit here, it arrives there. You can't stop water. Migration is a physical phenomenon. That's why we talk about pull effects, push effects. And indeed, pressure itself is a concept from physics with a very clear definition in physics. Now, faced with all of this, what can states do? The answer is, from some, nothing. I mean, a lot of well-meaning progressive intellectuals say irregular migration cannot be stopped. But the really dominant position in the debate is, no, it can, and it must be stopped by all means. Um, you probably know that there's literature in France for many decades of the great replacement. It, it starts with this book, um, Le Condition, Das Herlager der Heiligen, uh, which was written in the early 70s and talks about a million poor people from India going to France. It's a, it's a Bible for the far right. And the conclusion is it can be stopped, but it requires enormous force. But if this force, this violence at our borders is not used, Europe will be destroyed. Now take a breath, take a step back. 
let us check the facts because everything that I've presented to you now is a very, very memorable story, which is completely misleading. Let's look again at the UNHCR figures for the 80 million people that were displaced in the last global report. Well, first of all, let's break them down and we see that 45, actually 46 million of them are internally displaced. You know them because you look after them in many countries. But what is important is that the fact that so many more people are internally displaced in their own country than are refugees, which means crossing borders, tells us something about borders. It is very hard to cross borders. Then UNHCR tells us there are 26 million refugees, asylum seekers, which are also counted. We don't know what they will be because this will be determined by asylum services. And then for some reason, they keep the Venezuelans separate in the statistics. I'll do that too, but of course they exist, millions of Venezuelans displaced to neighboring countries. Now, who is counted? The strange thing is that this actually counts a, a vast divergence of people. It counts, for example, 8 million of these 80 million are internally displaced Colombians, many of whom have been displaced 20 years ago. Now, the, the, the civil conflict in Colombia supposedly ended a few years ago. Those 800,000 who went to Bogota and other big cities in 2002 are never going to go back. So they kept keep being counted. It also counts among the 26 million refugees, almost 5.6, well, almost 6 million Palestinian refugees. As we know, many of them, or all of them, are the descendants in the fourth generation of the 800,000 who left before 1948. That's the definition. You only count those who are the descendants only in the male line, for some strange reason, only the fathers are counted, of those 800,000. And the number increases all the time among the, for example, 2 million Palestinians in Jordan. Uh, this is not new displacement, but they are counted as refugees. So what we are then left with is actually 20 million refugees, according to the UNHCR mandate. Now, where are they? Well, 1 million are Afghans in Iran, some of whom have been there for, uh, again, two or three generations, leaving after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Uh, there are still, even in the statistic, uh, 200,000 million Chinese that were brought in from Vietnam to China in one year, in 1979. These are the only refugees China took. They are still counted as refugees because actually the criteria for this addition are very, very strange. It's actually states who determine who is to be counted. But if we look at the UNHCR numbers of refugees, where they are in the last years, what the trend is, we discover something absolutely fascinating. The trend between 2013 and 2019 for refugees is that the number went from 11 million to 20 million globally. Yes, it's doubled. That is a catastrophe. But where did it double? Here are the countries where the increase was the biggest. In Turkey, between 2013 and 2019, it went from 600,000 to 3.6 million. Then you have Uganda, Germany, Sudan, and Bangladesh. Now that means that 9 million additional refugees since 2013, 3 million are in Turkey, 1.1 million in Uganda, 1 million in Germany, almost 1 million in Sudan, and 800,000 in Bangladesh. That is already altogether 7 million. So if we look at the global refugee situation, we are actually dealing with this picture. 50% are in Europe of those 9 million. Of course, the largest share in Turkey. 40% are in Africa, 10% are in Asia, largely one country, which is Bangladesh. And that is basically because we have three big crises of this last decade, Syria, South Sudan, and the repression of the Rohingyas in Myanmar. These three crises create refugees who've crossed borders into other countries, um, and that have led to the doubling of the number globally. Now, suddenly, this image of pressure working across the world producing refugees Wait, what is really going on? What is really going on is that this is a crisis that would be manageable without abandoning core values. Because, and I want to present to you 10 facts for a different debate, because this image of an out of control displacement crisis around the world is not only misleading, but also politically very dangerous. Here are the facts. The number of refugees, those who cross borders in need in the world is manageable. The 20 million UNHCR counts includes people who are already in Germany, in Sweden, in America, in Canada, in Australia. So 
what we need to identify is where are refugees who've crossed borders are in a third country and are not looked after. You know, there's no international assistance needed for Germany or Sweden. There is for the African countries surrounding South Sudan or for the neighbors of Syria. And of course, this is what the UN Refugee Compact, which was approved by 181 states in December 2018 in the General Assembly, what it said. Countries of first reception should be helped more. The question is, is this happening? But as we look at the numbers, we see how can a world that is richer than ever not be able to help all countries of first reception for those 15, 16, 18, at most million refugees in need, some of whom have been displaced for many, many generations. Like two, almost all refugees in the world remain in neighboring countries. This is the criteria. It's not that UNHCR often says they all remain in poor or, or, or underdeveloped or developing countries. That happens because the conflicts are there. But when the conflicts are close to developed countries and Turkey, Turkey was not in the statistics a poor country, it's an OECD member. Um, then the refugees go to those countries. It's basically that refugees remain mainly in neighboring countries. So uh, this also shows us another fact. It's very hard to cross borders. The Syrian war created an exceptional crisis. It's the biggest refugee crisis since the, well, uh, crisis of uh, East Pakistan or Bangladesh in the early 70s. The number of people displaced internally as IDPs and externally is unprecedented for decades. And of course, this created huge pressure on some neighbors, and one of these neighbors is the European Union. So we shouldn't take what happened in 2015 as representative for what has happened in the last few decades worldwide. It was because a conflict, the biggest refugee crisis in the world for decades, happened right next to Europe. Of course, this was going to have an impact. Fact three. The fact that there are more IDPs than refugees is because it is very hard to cross borders. And one illustration of this is to look at the Syrians. Let's ask, it's not migration physics. It's not even pressure on people to leave. It is the policies of neighboring states that determine whether we have refugees. When and where could Syrians flee from their country? Well, they never fled to Israel. Israel is a neighbor. They never fled to Israel because Israel said, we will send our soldiers and we will not let you in. And that was it. Nobody could come in. They fled in large numbers to Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, as long as these three countries kept their borders open. When Jordan decided to close its border, you know, it was stuck in no man's land for years. And Turkey had open borders until it started to build the wall in 2015. In 2015, it started to build the wall, and now it is very hard to cross certainly for larger numbers. Fact four, and that follows from this, there is never going to be much irregular migration unless permitted by governments. This is actually a call to action. This is not a call to complacency. Irregular migration is not going to be out of control whatever happens. The civil war in Algeria in the 1990s did not mean that hundreds of thousands of Algerians went to France, just as the Syrian war did not mean that hundreds of thousands of Syrians fled to Israel. Governments take a decision how their borders look, and refugees are weak. They are not an army. They are not an invasion. They are people in need with no guns, with little pressure. And if they are confronted by an army, they cannot cross. Another one of these misleading books that came out recently that says that by 2050, 150 to 200 million Afro-Europeans will live in, in Europe, it's by an, an Africanist and journalist, Stephen Smith. And he says, if present migration flows continue, one third of Europe's population will be of African origin uh, very soon. Now, is that bad or good? Uh, he says it's bad. He says we need to do something to stop it. He says we need to build a fortress to stop this happening because he says it's bad for Europe. He also claims it's bad for Africa. But what are the facts? The facts are that from Africa, people can cross to the Canary Islands, to Ceuta and Melilla, directly across uh, the sea from Morocco to Spain, or from Libya to Lampedusa or Malta. I mean, this, these are the, the migration possibilities for irregular migrants from Africa to Europe. 
Uh, very few come to Turkey and then cross. I mean, these numbers are almost neg negligible for Africans. And what, if, what are the numbers, the real numbers? Here are the real numbers for a decade, from 99, 2008. And what we see, Spain and, and Italy, irregular migration, we are not talking about hundreds of thousands of people. These are the numbers per year, right? So in a year to Spain, on average, 15,000 people cross from the whole African continent to uh, the first country in the European Union. Italy, it's uh, on average around 25,000 in most of these years. And this continues. These are the, the numbers for Spain. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. There are ups and downs from 12,000 in 214 to 65,000 in 218. But okay, how do we grasp these numbers? Look first at Italy, and then we get to what all of this means. Italy, the same thing, except that there were four years in which the number increased a lot. In 2014, we suddenly talked about 170,000. In 2016, it was a record year. This is where all these books were written. And then it collapsed by the summer of 2017, the state, Italy changed its policy. And today the numbers are as low as they've been in the decades before. I mean, this is my point. It's up to states to determine how much irregular migration they are willing to accept. And here is the big picture. And this is the only number I think from all of this one needs to remember. For the last 20 years, the average number of people crossing from all of Africa into Spain, Malta, and Italy, in, into the European Union irregularly, is around 40,000 a year. With a few years that are totally exceptional, we can discuss that later why, but on average, the total irregular migration from Africa to Europe in the last decades has been 40,000 a year, and that's more or less what it has been also in the last three years. 40,000 a year means that to get to Orban's 30 million, which seemed plausible to some, will take 730 years. Now that means it's not very plausible. Why is migration pressure such a bad concept? Because look at Nigeria, the biggest, most populous country in Africa, 200 million people, 92 million in extreme poverty. In this theory of migration pressure, many of them should be leaving to other countries or to Europe, in fact, almost nobody is. Here are the numbers of Nigerians arriving irregularly in the European Union. We have the exceptional years, 216 was the record, but even in 216, from a country of 200 million, with millions of internally displaced, and with dozens of millions in extreme poverty, 37,000 came to Europe, and that is exceptional. In the last years, it was on average, one Nigerian a day who arrived irregularly in Italy. So this is the number to remember, and I repeat it, 42,000 arrivals a year, it breaks down to about 112 a day, is the trend of the last few decades with very few exceptions. And that, of course, was the exception that everyone remembers. When a million people, the majority of which were Syrians, crossed from Turkey to the European Union in Greece. These are the sea arrivals in Greece. But what we see is that this was 12 months in which in 12 months, a million people arrived which means in 12 months, more people arrived than in the last decade from all of Africa to the whole European Union. And then it stopped, but it wasn't high before either. In the 12 months after that, it was 26,000. I'll get to what was then done, but the fifth fact is this. The main question at borders is not whether states can control borders, but how. It becomes a political, I would say a moral question. We can control irregular migration, but do we have inhumane borders or can we have humane borders? And what is a humane border? Well, a humane border, I would say, is taking our own principles, our own conventions and law seriously. It means nobody is treated cruelly to send a signal to others. So we shouldn't be doing what Australia has been doing for the last eight years. The Australian policy is everybody who arrives irregularly has been put to Nauru and Manos, two little islands in the Pacific, and, and left there for years under very bad conditions. 14 suicides for a very small number of a few thousand people. We shouldn't do that. That is, of course, what we are now doing today on, uh, in Greece, on the mainland and on the islands, treating people in such a way that the message is, it's better to be in Turkey than in the European Union. Secondly, we shouldn't push people into danger. 
That's the core idea of the Refugee Convention. non refoulement Don't push people back. Well, that requires that we check if they might be in danger. That requires asylum decisions. That is what we are doing at the moment, directly and indirectly at the European borders. That is what the cooperation with Libya is all about. Uh, it's not that us, it's not that Italian ships are pushing people back. It's that we pay Libyans to pull people back into Libya, into camps where being, people are being tortured. Third, people should not die in large numbers. It's not a humane border, what we had in 2016, when thousands died in the Mediterranean. Now, we, my colleagues and myself, watching this and very worried, proposed in September and October 2015 what we call the Merkel Plan. Because we said that faced with a million people crossing into Europe, I mean, at that time it was only a, still a few hundred thousand, but we knew it would be a million uh, because this was the trend in the next few months. And it was another half a million in the, in the four months that followed. We said, if this isn't controlled across Europe, we will have parties come to power that say, well, let's just send soldiers. Let's just do pushbacks. Let's suspend human rights. Let's suspend the Refugee Convention. And we said, no, there must be a way to have control without abandoning our core values. We wrote this report, still online, and that led then, a few months later, in an indirect way, which again, I describe in my book, I will not go into, but if you're interested, we can say, discuss it, to the EU-Turkey statement. What was the core idea? The core idea was to return people after a cutoff date. So those who crossed to Greece after, in the end, the 20th of March, 2016, by sea, and who are safe in Turkey can be returned. Nobody else. Everybody who was there before stays. The Turks were clear. They wouldn't take them back. Now, we need something similar, actually, for a lot of people who are now in Europe who will never be returned, but who live in permanent fear that they might be deported. But this was the idea. Cut off date. Second, to preserve the right to asylum in Greece. This is explicit because it's only a press statement. It can't change the law. And the law in the EU is clear. Anybody who arrives in Greece has the right to claim asylum. Now, that means we need to determine who's safe in Turkey in a fair procedure and return those. The idea was, however, that if Turkey is checked to be safe and for Syrians uh, easily it could be safe with three million, three and a half million already living there for decades, for years now, um, it would be possible to stop people getting into boats if in return we do two things. Third point, support a million refugees in Turkey with six billion in the next four years. So from 214 to 219 or 220, end of 219. Uh, that was what the Turks demanded. And third, fourth, they said, we want to resettle refugees in an orderly way. So this was agreed to. When the flow would stop, and see, I'm using the word flow as well. When the number of people crossing would stop, then the European Union would start taking a bigger number of people, humanitarian resettlement, that's what it was called, directly from Turkey in a legal way. And finally, what the Turks insisted, if Turkey meets all the conditions, including human rights conditions, it would get visa liberalization. The EU agreed, Turkey doesn't meet the conditions, that's why there is no visa liberalization. And this was the plan on which uh, actually the Turks proposed it in that room in early, um, in early March 2016. That is the room of the, the, the office of the Turkish ambassador to the European Union. That is the Turkish prime minister who proposed this. He'd read our paper, of course, and his, I've been sitting in that room many times with his ambassador to, to argue for it. He proposed it to the German chancellor and to the Dutch prime minister who had then the EU presidency. Now, it was a Turkish proposal because Turkey said this is in our interest. And the impact, as you know, was that it did stop arrivals, irregular arrivals, very quickly. From a million, it went to 26,000 in a year. People no longer got into boats in large numbers. It dramatically reduced the number of people who drowned in the Aegean from 1,100 from 1, people drowning in the 12 months before to 81. And it mobilized 6 billion euros, which is the biggest aid in the history of the EU for refugees in a third country. It resettled also 28,000 Syrians to the EU which is a lot less than the Turks or than we had expected, and a lot less than should have been done. What never worked, however, was on the Greek islands. And this is the fundamental failure, um, the processing of very small number of claims. It isn't true because when you have 28,000 people arriving in 12 months, it isn't true that this couldn't be managed. 28,000 people in a, in a year arriving in an EU member state where the European Union committed to help 
with everything needed, money and resources, you should be able to accommodate them humanely and you should be able to process asylum claims quickly. But it wasn't done. Why we can discuss, I discuss it in detail in my book. Um, the, the simple answer is it wasn't wanted. And then the agreement broke down. In March 2020, the European Union actually didn't say to Turkey that it would continue to help. And the Turks said, well, listen, if you don't continue to help us with uh, looking after three and a half million refugees, why are we going to take anyone back? On the contrary, Turkey then started moving people to the border in a very cynical operation in end of February 2020, and then said, we will no longer take anyone back from, from, from Greece. And that is the end of the agreement. And what came then? Well, what came then was what we had always feared. The European Union became Australia. Every day since then, the Greek Coast Guard is pushing people back. The total number of pushbacks just last year, just in the Aegean, was more than 10,000, documented not only by NGOs and independent journalists, but filmed and documented on the website of the Turkish Coast Guard. So what the Turks, what the world sees now is that the moment there was no longer any agreement, the European Union said, well, listen, then we just uh, ignore our own laws. The Refugee Convention, it's dead. We did what Trump did at the same time in America, because Trump used the pandemic in 2020 to say that he would push back anyone who crossed from Mexico. And of course, in the last six months, the Americans uh, did push back more than 300,000 people without any procedure. I mean, pushbacks as policy. And they worked. That was one of my core facts. If member states, if, if sorry, if EU member states or if any state in the world decides we use force, irregular migration stops. Look at the numbers. April 2016 was the EU Turkey statement and the numbers immediately fell sharply. These are the regular arrivals across the sea. But look at 220. When Greece started pushbacks in April, the numbers fell to the lowest in 30 years. It's now about 200, 300 a month. So from the point of view of controlling migration, this was an even bigger success than the, the statement with Turkey. But the price was to give up on human rights protection, human dignity, and the refugee convention every day as a policy at the border of the richest union in the world. It's a very, it's an unacceptably high price. So I come to fact six of my 10 facts. Having humane borders and control because having your main borders without control, well, first of all, you will have a lot of deaths, but secondly, it is politically not viable. There is no democracy in the world that has no control if there is a large number of people trying to cross. Uh, it, it's the, we can deplore it, but it's the reality of democratic debates. But having your main controls, having your main borders and control doesn't come by itself. It requires an effort. It requires four things. It requires that we are able to determine who needs protection. I mean, this is the idea of non refoulement We don't push people back without checking whether they are safe. It requires decent reception conditions, unlike Australia, unlike Lesbos. It requires that we return only those not in need of protection, but returning those not in need of protection is required. But there we need to be realistic. I get to that in a moment. And finally, it requires offering something to other countries. Without offering something to other countries, return is impossible. It is key to distinguish between refugees and migrants because this is what the Refugee Convention and EU law does. But in order to do that, we need a fast and quality decision. If an asylum determination takes four years, it becomes cruel to deport people after four years when they have started to put down roots and create a new life, even if they are not then in need of protection. So a decision on who can be returned, a mechanism that can do that, which is an asylum service, an asylum system, is key if we want to preserve the Refugee Convention. Fact seven, all EU countries struggle to do that. Making fast asylum decisions is hard, but it's not hard because it's impossible. It's hard because most countries don't care. Why should you make a fast decision if in the end everybody stays anyways? Now, some countries even fear that if they make fast decisions, but everybody stays, it is an attraction for people to then, for example, leave Germany and go to the Netherlands because the decision is fast and they get refugee status quicker. So some countries have very good systems, 
but then on purpose slow things down. Now, in order to have fast quality decisions, it, and we can have this debate, it's a matter of resources. How many people do you have? Organization, how well-trained and organized are they? What is the quality of the interviews? And focus, do we want it? Fact eight, fast returns can reduce arrivals. We saw that, that even the idea that you might be returned quickly can reduce arrivals, but that only works with cooperation and cooperation is only possible if the numbers of returns are small. Turkey would never accept to take back 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 people. Of course not. Nobody in the world does. Turkey wouldn't accept it because it says rightly that we have three times more refugees in Turkey, uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey than in the whole of the European Union. So what you need is a cutoff date. This is the central idea of the refugee uh, agreement or the statement with Turkey, that from a date you return so that you don't need to return many. The fewer deportations there are, the better for everyone. And there we also can be return realists. Inter interior ministers around Europe know the figures, but they are pretending they ignore them. Look at all returns from Germany to these countries of people who are found not to need protection. Now, the total number of returns to Morocco in the first half of 219, and then in the first half of 220, was like this, a few hundred. The total number of returns to the Gambia, 60 in the first half of 2019, 22 in the first half of 2020. Now, there are 10,000 Gambians, most of whom would have to leave Germany, now living in Germany. With these numbers, it will take uh, 80 years. Now, that means we shouldn't pretend, unless we become brutal, some countries are. Of course, if you treat people like prisoners and not like human, right, human uh, beings with dignity, uh, you can deport uh, large numbers of people. I mean, this is what autocratic states do. But uh, if we treat people with human dignity, we will not be able to deport large numbers. Fact nine, sea rescues alone do not stop death. If we want to stop deaths, if we want to stop the mess dying in the Mediterranean, we need to reduce irregular arrivals. The question again is how? Look at this. In 2018, we had more rescue boats than in the history of the Mediterranean. There was a, an EU mission, there were Italian Coast Guard boats, there was the, a fleet of uh, NGO boats, big NGO boats, um, including some of the most respected NGOs in the world, and they rescued a record number of 180,000 people and brought them all to Italy. But that year of most rescues was the year of most deaths in history. 4,600 people died in one year, which was a, a number like in a war. More than people died in the troubles in Northern Ireland in more than two decades. Why did so many people die when we rescued 180,000 people? Because so many people risked in not seaworthy vessels, in fact, rubber boats. And the smugglers just didn't care if 2% of them died. Now, that is not an argument against rescues. It is an argument that rescues and reducing regular migration need to be combined. How do we do that? Well, I get back to what I've discussed before. But let me stop with point 10, fact 10. Legal ways for refugees can be popular. Now, this is also fundamental because if we try to reduce irregular migration of those who do not need protection, those who need protection have an incentive still to come irregularly. I mean, if you are um, a refugee and you are desperate, you risk your life, you know you will not be returned. You shouldn't be returned. So if we want to reduce not just the number of irregular arrivals, but the number of irregular arrivals by refugees, one way to do that is to improve conditions in third countries. Another way is to have resettlement. And here, Canada is an inspiration for Europe. As you know, Canada is taking in every year before the pandemic, 30,000 people through resettlement, of which 20,000 are taken in through sponsorship, where Canadian civil society, uh, churches, groups of citizens, associations can come together and say, we want to look after a refugee. And the government sets a total uh, number for sponsorships in a year, and then it controls the process, it checks if these are refugees, it checks their healthcare, it checks the security,
but it's the people who say we want to help. The end result is Canada takes in every year 30,000. The 20,000 they take in just through sponsorship. If Germany and France, the Benelux and the Nordics would do that, we would add 100,000 people at least a year who come in legally, which is many times more than came in irregularly across the sea in recent decades. And it is people who would come in like in Canada as refugees and would not need to fear deportation. They would have a status from the first day. So I call this the project 0.05 because that's the percentage of people who come to Canada just through sponsorship. Now, if Germany will take this number, France will take this number and the Benelux and the Nordics, we get to 100,000. This is politically doable. And for Austria, it would mean 4,000 people a year. Of course, Austria could absorb and resettle 4,000 refugees. And of course, I'm convinced if some of them could be brought in through sponsorship, there would be the support in society to do and help. So create a coalition for resettlement. Germany, Canada, the US, which had a flip-flop in the last week because uh, President Biden promised 120,000 resettlements a year. Then last week, for a moment, it looked like he went back to the Trump number of 15,000. Then his uh, national security advisor and foreign secretary uh, complained to him. And I know a little bit about the background story because friends are involved in this. Um, and well, in the end, uh, he, he went back to say, yes, we will go back to 120,000 a year. So if Canada and the US and Europe, this coalition, do just what Canada is already doing. We would have 250,000 resettlements a year of vulnerable refugees in safe and legal ways. This is a politically feasible, attractive, and humane objective. So this is my end, my last picture. Well, no, sorry. I, I, I then get to apply it to a few case studies. But the, the last of my facts. Humane borders are possible. It's a triangle of humanity and measures. Preserve the right to asylum, but make decisions fast. This is a matter of capacity. Have strategic returns. Don't promise mass deportations, which shouldn't happen and will not happen. Have cut off dates and increase resettlement. And finally, generous help for refugees in need. And of course, I would add, generous help for internally displaced people who are not able or who don't want to, but in many cases are not able to become refugees, but are in dire economic, uh, in dire uh, social and humanitarian conditions. But refugees that are already accepted by first countries of, by countries of first reception, the Ugandas, the uh, Bangladeshis, the Turkeys, the Lebanons of this world, they deserve generous help from international community. And prove it, prove it in Melia. I started with this film and this little boy. Well, what we see here is what I, I uh, one of my core facts, one of my core messages. Spain could stop, well, it couldn't stop, but it could reduce irregular arrivals. The, the offenses, the brutality, the pushbacks mean that today many less people attempt it than uh, five years ago, and many less people succeed. But imagine if instead of having a fence with barbed wire and pushbacks, those who cross into Melilla we would have fast asylum. Within a few weeks, we would know are they refugees or not. Most of the people who cross are not refugees, in fact. Uh, they never get refugee status in Europe. Make an offer to Morocco that they take back those who don't get refugee status um, or offer them to return them to their country of origin, have returns from a cutoff date, and have resettlement, including the possibility of resettling refugees from West Africa. Work with UNHCR to say, we are willing to bring in more refugees every year, 10,000, 15,000 to countries like Spain or Italy, but they shouldn't try to cross the fence and prove it in Malta. Same thing, have fast asylum for those, uh, on average, it's two and a half to 3,000 people who reach Malta, have offers to Tunisia to take people back, those who don't need protection in Europe, similar to the offers to, the, to Turkey in 2016, have returns that are strategic to stop irregular arrivals that kill people, have resettlement. Now, we can discuss the details, but this is the way to combine sea rescues, which we must continue, with lower numbers of deaths. And finally, prove it in Lesbos. The eu turkey statement is dead. What we see now is, a, is an alternative. It's a very effective uh, reduction of irregular arrival through inhumane borders. 
get away from this, push for a new Turkey statement 2.0. How this could look, I've, uh, I have, we've put that on our website and I'm, my colleagues and myself are pushing for this. So to conclude and to remind ourselves, the Syrian crisis was exceptional. The number of refugees in the world is manageable. It is hard to cross borders irregularly everywhere. Governments can stop most irregular migration. The big question, however, is how? Humane or inhumane borders? Humane border control requires an effort. It's not easily done. The challenge is to have fast and quality asylum decisions in line with EU law and the convention. Returns that are supposed to be fast require cooperation. Sea rescues alone do not stop deaths and resettlement can be popular. And all of this, um, alas, in German, you'll find in my book. Um, and uh, this is the website to the book, grenzen.eu. And I very much look forward to the debate. Thank you.